Okay, questions about I don't know, last time, this time. Yes, no. Okay, so we, this is, today we're finishing up chapter 15. 16 and 17 are NMR, IR, mass spec, which are resources for lab. 18 was free radical halogenation, which we all did last semester. And so we're going to move into 19. Um, and we'll have to kind of set the stage for Monday. I did put the folder up for Monday along with video and the reading assignment. Um, and we'll and I'll kind of set up where we're going to go with that um, at the end here. So ask as I go. All right, here's my first here's my my starting point then. We need to finish up the we need to finish up the reaction there are the reactions of ether. So so far, you can combust them, you can make peroxides, neither of which you necessarily want to do. Ethers make great solvents because they really don't react. But if you were going to do a third reaction on them, you would be able to take something like, let's say, tertiary butyl methyl ether and add two equivalents of HBr to it. And this is going to be called an ether cleavage reaction. Now, all the reactions, except for combustion, except for peroxide formation, have all been SN1 or SN2 reactions. Right? That's how we made the ethers. This is going to be no different. So what would be the first step in this mechanism to do ether cleavage? Protonate the ether oxygen. Okay, so I'm going to react that with H+. Plus. And I'm going to go ahead and make the oxonium ion out of that. Okay, now, I'm going to have two equivalents of H plus and two equivalents of Br minus. But what would be the next step then? What would you like to do? So you want to have the oxygen leave as a leaving group? Yeah. Okay, which, what do you want to go with it? The tert-butyl group or the methyl group? The... Do we want to take the methanol and have it leave? No? What do you want to do? Have the terse butyl leave. All right, let's take a vote. You don't have to worry about your cards because people have lost those already, apparently. <laughs> Hopefully we still have fingers. So what, what would you like to leave with the oxygen? Number one is going to be terse butyl. Number two is going to be the methyl group. Don't, you know, you don't have to hold it up like this so everybody looks around and see how many fingers people are doing. You can kind of do it like this and then, then that way it's like you're sort of anonymous. So which group do we want to add? One or two? And don't hide it from me because then I can't see it. <laughs> so what do we want? What do we want to leave? One or two? I see some ones, I see some twos, probably a couple more twos than ones, but there are some ones and twos. So let's try both and see what happens. So let's have number one, let's have the terse butyl group leave. So let me break the carbon oxygen bond, give the pair of electrons so that I form a tertiary butyl the tertiary butyl alcohol and what's left over.
Good move? Yeah, not really. Methyl's going to be even less stable than a primary. So we don't want to do that. So instead what we want to do is take the pair of electrons and give it to the oxygen from the tert butyl side. That will give us a tertiary butyl carbocation and it will have methanol leave. Now have we done that in the past? Maybe. But if you go through, if you take your notes and you replace the CH3 with an H, we've done that over and over and over again. So an alcohol can be a leaving group when it's protonated to form noxonium ion, just like water can. But it, in this case, I've got a tertiary carbon on one side, a methyl carbon on the other. If I'm going to break the bond, and you don't have to, we'll do the other mechanism here in a minute, if you're going to break that bond, we want to form a stable carbocation. So we want to lose the methanol molecule. Now, if there were two tertiary carbons on either side, you could do both. You could do one or, you know, you could do either one. If it was tertiary or secondary, but when it's primary, you have to let the other group leave. Right. Everybody okay with that? So methyl, methyl carbocations, Okay in mass spectrometry, not in lecture. Okay. So now I have this. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen with my tert-butyl, with my uh, tert-butyl carbocation and my methanol? So I'll add my first Br minus. And so when I add my first Br minus, I'm going to end up with the first product, which is tertiary butyl bromide, I still have my CH3OH as the first product. Now, there is another mechanism that I'll show you in a moment. If we only added one HBr, we would get a mixture of different products. Um, we're going to add two HBr, so we do this twice and we end up with the same products regardless of the mechanism that we use. All right, so now I have a second HBr. What am I going to do? I got a second equivalent of H plus Br minus. Three words. Protonate the oxygen. Okay, so now I'm going to make that oxonium ion. Let me, let's take a step back here. What mechanism did I do for the first product? SN1. So the first step was an SN1 step. Why? Carbocation intermediate. All right, so I did SN1 first. Now I've got a CH3 with an oxonium ion. What's going to happen here? I'm going to get an SN2 mechanism. The SN2 mechanism is going to be because the Br minus does what? Comes in, attacks the carbon, and the leaving group leaves. So on the next exam, I'm probably going to ask you what, there'll probably be a graded homework assignment before that on the mechanism of this, which we'll get, I'll, I'll do next week. Let me get caught up on grading. <coughs> on all my grading first, and then we'll pile on more grading. Um, I'll probably ask you for the transition state of the SN2 steps. So in this case, let's write the transition state. So we've got the Br forming a bond to the carbon with the three hydrogens on it, then a partial bond to the water that is on its way out. Uh, charges, so that's my partial bonds. What are my partial charges on this? Bromine, delta, minus, oxygen, delta plus. Okay. All right, so then we would have that transition state, and then we're going to form our fi final product, which is going to be methyl bromide and water. So the overall reaction of this cleavage produces 
the tertiary bromide, the methyl bromide, and the water. So I'm cleaving the ether. I'm putting two bromines on both <coughs> groups and then turning the oxygen into water. So this is ether cleavage by using, and you could use NEHX for this, HCl, HBr, HI. So this was SN1 followed by SN2. Okay. Right, does that make sense? So then the question is, what's another way to do this reaction? Could I do SN2 followed by SN1? Yes. So what would that look like? Well, let's go back to the original molecule, the original ether, and I'm going to go ahead and just protonate it right off the bat. So in a me if you had to do both mechanisms, which I may ask you to do on a practice graded problem, you can go ahead and just say, I'm going to start with this. I showed how to make it at the beginning. So now what am I going to do? How do I do SN2? So I'm going to have my Br minus attack one of the two carbons on either side of the oxygen. Let's play the one and two game again. So if this reaction is going to go SN2 to start with, who is the bromine going to, who is it going to attack? Is it going to attack the number one group, the tertiary group, or is it going to attack the methyl group? the number two group. What do you think? I'm just waiting for more fingers. I see twos, I don't see, I see a one. So SN2, is the SN2 reaction going to occur with a, the tertiary part? Can tertiary undergo SN2? No, it's tertiary. So which one is it most likely to undergo of well, one that's less sterically hindered, which is going to be the methyl side? So it's most likely going to attack the methyl group, which is fine because the bromine will come in, it'll attack the methyl group, and we'll lose now tersbutanol as the leaving group. So we could write the transition state for that. It's going to be Br dot dot with a C with an H on the three sides, and now on the other side we're going to have our O with our tertiary group. Charges, nope, sorry, I didn't, I got to protonate that. Charges, same as before. Br delta minus, O delta plus. Okay, so now I just made the methyl bromide first, and I've got the tersbutanol. So that's the first equivalent of HBr. Now, second equivalent of HBr. What am I going to do? I'm going to protonate the oxygen. So now I'm going to make that oxonium. I'm going to make that oxonium ion. Okay. What's going to happen next? Well, let's think about that. So Br minus coming in and attacking that carbon and kicking the water off, what mechanism would that be? No, That'd be SN2. Can the tertiary system undergo SN2? No. So it's not, that's not going to happen. 
Instead, what's going to happen? The water leaves. So the water's going to leave. So I'm going to lose my water, and then I'm going to form my carbocation. And now that I form my carbocation, what's going to be the next step? The Br minus is going to come in. So I'm going to end up with my tertiary butyl bromide. So in this case, what I'm doing is I've now reversed the order. I've done SN2 first and SN1. So either one of these mechanisms would be acceptable. Does that make sense to everybody? I mean, that's all we've done with ethers is pretty much SN1 and SN2, which makes them a good review. But for the most part, they are unreactive. They don't react with Grignards. They don't react with things like Camino 4. Um, they make great extraction solvents because they're not soluble in water, but they have low boiling points because they don't have OH groups. So that's why we use them in lab is as uh, extraction solvents. The only issues they have are peroxides and catching on fire. But outside of that, they're pretty, they're pretty inert. This is just one of the reactions you could do. Somebody asked this morning, they said, is one of these two mechanisms preferred? The easy way to find out is to have one equivalent of HBr and see if you get more tertiary bromide versus methyl bromide, I would suspect that would be the case. Because S, because even though SN1 has multiple steps, it sometimes occurs a lot faster than SN2. I'll give you the example. Last semester in lab, what did we do with our SN2 <coughs> reaction? We took butanol, primary alcohol, we added sulfuric acid and bromide and sodium bromide. That was the equivalent of HBr. And it took us 45 minutes of reflux to get the reaction to go. If we would have done the companion reaction to that, which is tertiary butyl alcohol and HCl, we would put it in a centrifuge tube, capped it, shook it, reaction's over. So comparing the rates of SN1 and SN2 is apples and tanks or whatever. Totally unsimilar object it would be because you can't really compare the two. That's why I've never asked you to compare SN1 or SN2 in one of those, which reaction goes faster, because you can't. So even though there's multiple steps, if you're adding HCl or HBr to an alcohol, the SN1 pathway goes faster. But the reason we add two equivalents of HBr or HCl is because we get the same product either way. Okay, so this is ether cleavage. That's the last of the reactions. Does that make sense to everybody? So there were other topics for today, but they were just kind of like review. Acid opening epoxides. Really? Do we need to beat that more to death? Probably we do, but we won't. Right? Acid and base epoxide opening, hopefully we can remember that until the end of the semester and beyond. Any questions? So then what I want to do is I want to kind of set the stage for um, what's called 1-2 and 1-4 edition on that you'll, you'll watch over the weekend or read in the book or both. Um, but I want to start with this molecule. I want to start with this alcohol and I want to add HBr to it. And I want to define a couple of terms here. So the OH group is attached to a carbon attached to the double bond. And the question is what kind of carbon is that? What is it called? It is called an allylic carbon. Have we heard that term before? 
You've heard it from me in lab with mass spectrometry because that carbon forms a, forms a stable carbocation. So we'll talk about that. The carbon attached to a double bond is called vanillic. Is in vinyl. The allylic carbon is going to be. The allylic carbon is really going to be the um, topic in chapter 19. And then in chapter 20, we're going to replace. The double bond with a benzene ring and it'll change from being allylic to benzylic. So there is a, there is a sequence, there is a logic to going over these, these topics. But my question is, I'm going to add HBr to the, to the allylic alcohol here. What is the first step of the mechanism? Protonate the oxygen. That's one possibility. That is one possibility. What's the other one, though? So add the H plus to the double bond and then add the bromine to the resulting carbocation. So in this case, I have two possibilities. I could add HBr to the double bond, Markovnikov, 50-50 cis-trans, or I could add the H plus to the alcohol. And the question is which one is going to occur? And that's an interesting question, because up until like, I don't know, uh, six to eight months ago, I would have, I would have said, well, I, I really can't predict it, but now I can. Because this has to do with a project that Brian's working on, and we'll talk more about this because it's really it's really annoying. Um, it was one of those things that I teach, you know, that I'll talk I'll tell you about in the future. But then it's like I don't know I don't know what's going on. But if we added H plus to that molecule, which is um, it's called uh, dimethyl styrene. If I added H plus, you could make an argument that the H plus is going to add to this carbon to form a tertiary carbocation. Or you could make an equally compelling argument that will become more compelling later, although wrong, um, that you could add the H plus to the tertiary carbon and make a secondary carbocation that is benzylic and is next to the benzene ring and therefore there's a bunch of resonance structures you can draw for that secondary carbocation. Some of which if you were in my lab you had to, do, you had to draw those resonance structures out for the benzylic carbocation. So which one happens? Right. And usually I would say it's the bottom one that happens because you're going to form a structure with resonance structures. Um, this would make it, as soon as we nail all this stuff down, including that it doesn't go by a free radical mechanism because then your radical would either be benzylic or tertiary, which would completely change the, the way the HBR adds, which is not going to be easy to rule out. But Hopefully, if I give this talk, it'll be with a bunch of people, organic chemists and people that teach it, and then I can say, which one is it going to be? And then everybody, uh, there's fist fights that break out because they're arguing amongst themselves which one it's going to be, because you can make equally compelling arguments for both. The reality is, at least under the conditions we're doing it, you get the tertiary carbocation, which is the true Markovnikov product. Now, why? Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to figure out. Um, but we actually get a lot, we get that product. And in the process of doing this, what we found was that on paper, when we add HBR to a double bond, 
it's like, boom, it just reacts like that. Yeah, no. I think he just worked up the reactions um, last night, and they had been stirring for seven days. They may or may not have gone to completion in those seven days at room temperature. So one of the things we found was that, H, that HBr adding to a double bond actually takes some time. It's not a fast reaction. Now there's another modification of this that um, a Japanese group published in December that we found by accident that where it will go in three hours. And it's actually a little bit greener reaction. But it, and they're the ones that reported that you get the H there and the BR there. And they just said, oh, it's Markovnikov addition. Not even commenting on the obvious, well, why isn't it the other one? Well, because it's not, because that's all they got was the adding the BR to the tertiary position. So we're trying to figure this out, but what we found was HBR adding to a double bond is actually a pretty slow process. So that means that if we come back over to our molecule, the H plus will react with the OH much faster than it will the double bond. Because adding HBr or HCl to a double bond is a slow process. Something I didn't realize, didn't have the ambition to look up, didn't take the time, but we just found it by accident, serendipity, whatever. And now it's clear what we should do here. Because the double bond reacts very slowly with the HBr. But the alcohol will be protonated. Now it'll be protonated and then it'll lose the H plus and it'll get protonated again and lose the H plus. So I mean that's an equilibrium like we talked about on Wednesday. But the first step is going to actually be in this case, and I would have made this the first step regardless of having any evidence for it, because this is where I want to go. Adding the HBr to the double bond doesn't get me where I want. So I'm going to add the H plus to that and I am going to end up with, oops, always make sure you have the right number of carbons. Then I'm going to end up with that oxonium ion. Okay. So that oxonium ion is going to form a lot faster than the HBr adding to the, to the double bond. What happens next? What do you want to do? I don't want to kick off the water. You, you want to kick the water off? Okay. We'll do that. Are we just kidding? No. <laughs> You can't take it back. <laughs> let's lose the water and let's form. Let me let me write this now as a CH2. I'm just writing in the hydrogens explicitly. I'm going to form that carbocation. No, why not? It is primary. I'll give you that. So it's primary allylic. It's more than it could be okay. It's okay. Why? Why is it okay? It's primary. It's primary allylic. So what does that mean? That means that I can take this pair of electrons and I can move it over here. So I can take and break the carbon. I can break the middle and write carbon double bond and give that pair of electrons to the middle and left to make the double bond. And what am I going to form when I do that? I'm going to form a double bond to the CH, and then the CH2 on the right will become positively charged. I just drew a pair of resonance structures. The more resonance structures you can draw, the more stable. 
So this is at least more stable than a run-of-the-mill primary carbocation that you are forbidden to draw. This is more stable than that, Sarah. Um, would this happen more than SN2? Well, that's the other option. That's the other option. The other option would be, let's say I have a primary, my BR minus comes in, attacks that carbon and kicks off the water, and I end up with the BR then, whoops, the BR attached to the CH2. So SN2 is a possible mechanism for this. That is a possible mechanism for this. We're going to, we'll talk about allylic carbons because they actually have enhanced SN2 rates. We'll talk about that next week. So I, I want to go down the SN1 road here. And how you would test that. There's a couple of ways you could test, you could test which one actually occurs, whether it's going to be SN1 or SN2. But what I have to do is I have to be able to distinguish between I have to be able to distinguish between this carbon and this carbon. So that, if I can do that, then I can tell the difference of whether it's SN1 or SN2. That's not a bad idea. Sometimes crazy ideas come to me when I'm like, that, this is a crazy, this was a crazy idea over here. And I'm like, let's see what happens. And then I regret doing that, but we'll get there. It's just if you're going to propose something that might be controversial, you have to have all the evidence. Because there's one thing that scientists love to do, and that's slam other scientists. Right. So first thing we got to do is show that there's no free radical in there, which I might be able to do with a new instrument that's the chiller's being fabricated. Apparently, I'll get that whenever it gets built and shipped to me. Then I got to figure out how to use the instrument. We're a ways away. So yeah, if I could tell, you. how might I do that? Let's say somehow I was able to replace those two hydrogens with deuteriums. Now they're different, so I'd be able to tell whether I'd be able to tell how much was SN1, SN2. That's not a bad idea as long as I don't have to make it. Somebody, if I can buy it with the deuteriums, that's that's the best. If I get to synthesize it, good luck with that. But we could do that. So right now we're going to say, you know what? Both passive ways are possible. Let's just focus on SN1. Because that's what's going to set up one day. Well, we'll come back to SN2. So I got these two resonance structures. Great. What's the real structure, though? Neither of those, the real structure is the resonance hybrid. So I would write the resonance hybrid for this intermediate. So I would have a CH2 with a partial double bond to the CH partially double bonded to the C other CH2, and then each one of those carbons would be delta plus, and if you're not up on writing your resonance hybrids, you will be next week. Right, so now I've got my intermediate carbocations. The true structure is the resonance hybrid. Now I need to add Br minus to this. Well, where's the Br minus going to add? The Br minus is going to add here, or it's going to add there. Or what's really going to happen is it's going to add to both 50-50, since it's symmetrical. Here's something that we're going to do that kind of violates the rules. But adding the Br to the resonance hybrid, it's like, well, what do I do with the dotted lines? Like in the final product, where does the double bond go? So to, so to make it a little bit easier to understand, we're going to react to Br- minus with each of the resonance structures. Resonance structures aren't real, but we're going to use them to do the reaction, because then it's easy. Right, then I say, okay, my Br- minus comes in, adds to this carbocation. I add the Br here. I get that product. 
My Br minus comes in and adds to the car when the carbocation's on the right, and I get the product on the on the right here. They're the same product. So in this case, which carbon is it adding to? It's adding to both. It could also be doing SN2, and I get the same product there. Oh. I bet you we could tell if it was SN1 or SN2 if we think about kinetic rates. So if I added something like HBr, if I added something, well, let's see what, I could add multiple equivalents of HBr. Right? So if I added, or, or I could add one equivalent of H plus and then change the concentration of the Br minus. If I doubled the concentration of the Br minus and the rate of the reaction doubled, that means the bromine attacking and kicking out the water, it's SN2. It's dependent on the rate of the nucleophile. If I doubled or tripled the concentration of the bromine, it didn't make didn't have anything to do with it, then didn't change it, that would be SN1. But how in this case, if I did this molecule, I'd be making the same one either way. I wouldn't be, I still can't tell the difference between adding to the carbon on the left or adding to the carbon on the right. I, that crazy idea is coming during lecture. So if we wanted to tell the difference between SN1 and SN2, that's what we do. That's what I would try first. Then I try and find out, see if I could make those two asymmetrical without changing the molecule too, too dramatically. So the SN1 pathway is, let's make the carbocation. There are two resonance structures. Let's react each of the resonance structures with the Br minus. And we make the product. And in this case, we make both products. Right. OK, let's change the reaction. Okay, let's change the reaction and now let's put an extra methyl group on. Let's still assume this is an SN1 mechanism. So what happens? The water or the OH gets protonated by the water. I make my oxonium ion. I lose my H2O and I end up with this carbocation, take my pair of electrons, move it over, make my second carbocation, add my Br minus to each one, And I make my two problems. That was a dilemma. What's my dilemma? I have two products. Whenever I have two products, what's my next question? What's the major product? Anybody want to propose which one of those two is the major product? Left or right? Left? Why? Left hand product? I would say right, but I would suspect that it would have double bond internally then. Okay. 
Proposal is the right-hand product is the major product because it's a more substituted double bond. Perfectly good logic. Don't worry, I'm not going to say you're wrong. <laughs> perfectly good logic. Anybody have some perfectly good logic for this one? What did this product come from? A secondary carbocation versus a primary. Okay, secondary allylic, primary allylic. But you could argue over here, well, which one of these? This one's the major product because it came from the most stable intermediate. Now, we've done reactions both ways, right? We've made the most stable product. We've made the product from the most stable intermediate. So which one is the major product? And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> it's going to depend. On what? The conditions, of the, the temperature, the time of the reaction, it's going to depend. So next week, so on Monday we'll talk about, or you'll hear me talk about over the weekend, kinetics versus thermodynamic. But this is the dilemma that we have with this molecule. <coughs> Which one is the major product? I could argue both sides. Not only can I argue both sides, but if I change the conditions, I can switch one to the other. So it's just going to be a little more complicated reaction than this, but that's what we're going to talk about on Monday, and we'll come back and talk about this as well, including dreaded reaction coordinate diagrams. So if you have questions, I'll post some, I'll probably post some practice problems here. Um, that you can do, but again, the quiz on Monday, I'll post those over the weekend. Questions, email me or put them on Piazza.